Um, so this time we'll be talking about uh, parsing with dynamic programming. So I talked about shift reduce parsing last time. Uh, and I'm talking about parsing with dynamic programming this time. And these are kind of the two big paradigms if you want to create something like a tree structured uh, output uh, for whatever reason. So as before, my examples are going to be from syntactic parsing, but uh, there's lots of other tree structures that you could be generating. So these are uh, algorithms are applicable there as well. Um, so. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we have two types of linguistic structure, dependency structure and phrase structure. Um, the reading focused on uh, dynamic programming algorithms for dependency structure. I'm also going to talk about neural methods for uh, stuff like phrase structure. Um, the reason why I'm not, the reading was not about that is because I think everybody has uh, kind of done the CKY algorithm and uh, algorithms for NLP or your similar uh, NLP class. So um, it builds heavily on top of that, but I assume that uh, most people have an idea of that already. So um, we talked about transition-based models this time, and now we're going to talk about uh, dynamic programming models. Um, and the dynamic programming models, like in the reading, uh, calculate the probability of each edge or constituent, and then do some sort of dynamic programming over these. Um, and in the reading, this is uh, mainly just review. Um, so this is uh, first order graph-based dependency parsing models um, where we express each uh, sentence as a fully connected directed graph. Uh, we score each edge independently. So we get you know, these scores here. Um, and then we, uh, we create a, a, tr a tree using a, a spanning tree algorithm. So in the... Um, in, in the reading, they talked about uh, first uh, edge factored models. So edge factored models and first order models are basically the same thing. So um, edge factored, uh, edge factored, and first order both basically calculate the um, the scores for the edges independently, and then um, and then calculate the tree from this. So. Just to compare their relative merits, uh, the advantage of graph-based, of transition-based models is um, they're relatively easy to implement. Uh, you can even view a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model as essentially a transition-based parsing model. Um, another thing is that they can e easily condition on infinite uh, tree context. Um, and you can do a structured prediction over this. Um, the problem, like I mentioned before, when I was contrasting CRFs to sequence to sequence models is, again, that they have a greedy search algorithm. Um, this can cause short-term mistakes if you make a mistake and then this leads you down a, a bad path. Uh, uh, compared to graph-based models, um, graph-based models can find an exact best uh, global solution via a dynamic programming algorithm. Um, but the problem is they have to make local independence. Assumption. So this is the same as uh, the, the contrast between CRFs as well. So you can see uh, the, the connections between these. Um, so the Chu Liu Edmonds algorithm, so the idea is we want to go, we want to do the second step of this. So after we calculated all the edge scores, we want to go to a, um, uh, we want to go to a <coughs> spanning tree. So we greedily select the best incoming edge to each node. If there are cycles, uh, contract the cycle into a single node and then recursively call the algorithm on the graph. So um, as we saw in the reading, um, we find this thing where the two highest scoring edges form a cycle. Um, we uh, uh, subtract the max uh, incoming one to each and uh, contract the cycle and then uh, calculate this and then uh, expand the cycle appropriately. And then we can get our tree. Um, so were there any questions about, about this process? I, I think uh, the book described it pretty well, but uh, yeah. Uh, could you go to the slide with the borders in which you are uh, you the pros and cons of the two? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, easily conditional in finite tree context. What is <coughs> why, is that, uh, why is that not possible with graph based methods? Um, sure. OK, so uh, I think that that's a good question. A good question. So to go back to um, my comparison of like CRFs 
and um, CRFs versus independent, completely independent models versus um, versus sequence to sequence models. If you remember, uh, when we calculated the scores of um, the score of uh, P of Y given X, uh, big Y given X, so this is like all our structure on the output side. Um, the independent model, the way it calculated it was P of Y I given all of X, so it basically calculates them independently. Um, then the sequence to sequence model, or the model that uh, conditions on all your context is basically conditioning on all your previous decisions. Um, and then kind of the CRF based model um, relaxed this to some extent, where you're conditioning on a previous decision, um, but you only condition on one, on one previous decision like this. Um, and the reason why you want to do this is because something like this, and also something like this, is, are conducive for uh, <coughs> doing dynamic programming over structures. Um, whereas this, you can't do any sort of dynamic programming algorithm, algorithm and you have to completely expand them. Um, so the Chu Liu Edmonds algorithm has a big assumption here, which is that all of the edge scores are independent of whether you pick an edge or not, right? So basically, the Chu Liu Edmonds algorithm, to put it in context of this, is essentially an independent selection algorithm. It's edge factored, it's first order, which means you don't consider any of the other edges while you're calculating the scores of the edges. But it has an additional algorithm on top that picks the only valid spanning trees. So if you just used your independent selection algorithm, basically you would, you would get something that looks like this, which isn't a tree. So you run the dynamic program on top to ensure that you actually get a tree in the end. Um, so that's kind of, uh, this is first order, um, or edge factored. And then this here, uh, things like transition-based parsing models, every previous edge that you've generated, you actually can consider when making your next decision, right? Um, so if you remember the stack LSTM, it had the shape of all the trees that you've generated before on your stack. So you could use that to make your decisions. So that's like this. So this is like infinity order. Um, and then in parsing, um, there's also higher order parsing models. So there's uh, first order parsing models, then second order, then third order, then fourth order. Um, and basically what they do is they look at only the neighboring edges of the edges and then uh, calculate basically um, features based on these neighboring edges. And I'll talk about those in a little bit, but um, yeah. Is it different quick? from uh, the transition-based parsing model not being able to capture tenant-dependent relationships between words that are far apart? Um, so the transition-based parsing models, especially if you use something like neural networks, are actually able to con uh, consider that because they're neural networks and they can do anything, <laughs> theoretically. Uh, but um, if they're very far apart, you'll suffer from all the problems that you normally have, like RNNs not being easily able to capture things that are very far apart. So, um, the, the, that is what we should do. That, um, so the, the reason why it's less of an issue here is because you're running a big algorithm on top that ensures the consistency of the, uh, of the tree overall. Um, and that is, that's run in a way that you can get the maximal tree without making any greedy decisions anywhere in there. So if you have a transition-based parsing model and you make a greedy decision, at the, you're forced to basically make a greedy decision at the beginning before you know what the shape of the rest of the tree looks like. So, um, yeah. So in the algorithm, what happens if you have something like a four going from root to that and five going from root to five? Can you collapse the numbers? Which edge do you see? Uh, you have four going from book to... That, which is... Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. um, so what you do, 
is you then um, can track the node. You keep both of them, and they have their scores. And then you um, recursively call the algorithm. So this basically allows you to fi figure out which one you should be using. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So uh, what if you have an exa exactly a tie, basically? You, uh, you, your, your question is, what, what if there's a tie in the score? Um, if there's a tie in the score, then you have to br break ties arbitrarily, I guess. Like, you don't have any, you don't have any criterion about how you would do that. Um, you, you could just say, we pick the, the leftmost one whenever it ties. But if it's a neural model, you'll never get ties, right? Because you randomly. Or, or almost never get ties because you randomly initialize the parameters, and the, these parameters are randomly initialized so that you get basically slightly different values every time. So it's not uh, actually a problem. Um, anything else? Okay. Um, so I will move on uh, to the next one. I think these were uh, these were good questions. Um, I would just like to point out that there are other dynamic programs that people use uh, for um, parsing dependency parses. Um, one is Eisner's algorithm. So this is uh, named after Jason Eisner at JHU. Um, and it's a dynamic programming algorithm to basically combine together uh, trees in O of n cubed. I, I, won't exactly, um, I won't exactly talk about it here, but basically there's two things to know about this. Uh, one is that it's very similar to CKY. It's a, basically a modification of CKY, uh, the CKY algorithm to uh, dependency parsing. And another thing is that, um, like many dynamic programming algorithms, it can only find projective dependency trees. So um, it, the difference between projective and non-projective dependencies, uh, was that elaborated in the reading or, or no? I, I forget. It was, OK. So yeah, but basically, non-projective trees have crossing arcs. This is not super important in English, because it's very rare to have this in English. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example. Was there, was there any, a good example in the book? I haven't looked. Uh, so an example would be, um, I, I won't be able to come up with, with an example without wasting your time. But basically, um, uh, one thing is that you can put yesterday almost anywhere in an English sentence. And if you put yesterday in the correct place, then uh, you can get a non-projective tree is one thing I remember. So like uh, like time-based uh, time based adverbs, you can put almost anywhere, and that can create non-projective trees. If, if someone has a good example later, I can, uh, I can write it on the board. Um, so there's also uh, Tarjan's algorithm. Um, it's basically a more complicated version of Chu Liu Edmonds. It does the same thing, but it, it's uh, slightly faster. So this is, if you actually want to implement this and have it be fast, this is a good, uh, good thing. Um, OK, so how do you train? And I think this was brushed over very, very briefly in the, in the reading, so it wasn't covered uh, very well. But in graph-based parsers, it's very common to do structured training, where you actually run the dynamic program as part of your inference algorithm, so or, or part of the training algorithm. So basically, um, the idea is that you use the structured hinge loss, uh, which I talked about in, um, in the previous class. Um, so you find the highest scoring tree, and you penalize each correct edge by the, uh, by the margin. And if the found tree is not equal to the correct tree, you update the parameters using the hinge loss. So, um, so basically, if you remember last time uh, when I was talking about part of speech tagging, we had an algorithm that steps through the part of speech tags and penalizes the uh, penalizes the correct tag. So I, I called this like evil teacher forcing or, or something like this. So in this case, we have the same thing where each incorrect edge gets like a bonus in its score. Uh, you run your inference algorithm. You get the, the highest scoring tree according to this. And if it doesn't match um, your correct tree, uh, then, then you do a parameter update. 
So this is, uh, this is widely used. It's especially widely used um, when you're not doing edge factored parsing, but when you're doing uh, second order or, or third order parsing. Um, then before we used neural networks, we, uh, we did lots of feature engineering. So um, when we're designing neural networks to solve our tasks, I think it's important to know the features that people used in previous tasks. And um, the answer is that we wrote these beautiful tables in our papers that listed all the different combinations of uh, features that we used. And uh, it's things like the, the word of the parent, the word of the part of, uh, uh, the part of speech of the parent, uh, the combination of the two, the word of the child, the part of speech of the child, the combination of the two. Um, and then the combination of these combinations uh, for like over the edge, uh, for the parent and the child, um, part of speech uh, combinations, all, all these kind of things here. So you can look at the uh, the feature templates, but basically the idea is uh, you use things like um, uni uh, unigram features over just the words, which tell you whether the head is likely to be, the, the parent word is likely to be a parent. Uh, things over the child, which tells you whether it's likely to be a child. So for example, verbs are very likely to be parents whereas uh, determiners are almost always childs. So this would be one example here. And then, of course, the combinations of the two. So verb, uh, verbs tend to be parents of nouns uh, would be one example. Um, all of these features are conjoined with arc direction and arc distance. So the idea here is that you want to know whether it's facing left or right, um, and also how long is the dependency arc. So this is a really strong feature telling you um, uh, how far away are things, and things that are closer together tend to attach much more often than things that are far apart. Um, and also part of speech combination features, etc. Um, another thing that people did uh, at this point, which shows you that people were thinking about things even before neural networks were invented, was they would uh, take long, uh, long words, or not neural networks were invented, but before uh, they were used for this task. Um, they would take long words and represent the words with a prefix. So this is like our character embeddings in neural nets, right? So the character embeddings in neural nets attempt to abstract away from the surface form. So if you do the same thing here, you can get rid of the suffixes and uh, just focus on the first part. So um, this is the basic model where you predict each, uh, each edge independently and then do the algorithm on top of it. Um, so before, directly before neural networks um, became uh, the standard method for using this, the thing that people worked on very hard was higher order dependency parsing. So higher order dependency parsing looks at edge combinations, basically. So um, it, you could look at uh, pairs of edges, or three edges, or four edges, et cetera. Um, so, you know, first order looks like this, and you can do saw, saw girl. Um, second order looks like this, where you can say I saw girl, uh, saw girl, uh, or saw with telescope, for example. Um, and third order would be I saw girl with, uh, saw girl with telescope, etc. So these are things that basically can capture combinations of words being put together. And you can see a lot of these actually really, really make sense, right? So um, if you know there's a certain class of things that people see with, uh, with telescopes, then this would be a very indicative feature that, uh, um, that you should be using in your parser. Um, so the advantage here is that you can be much more expressive. The disadvantage, um, the there's kind of two disadvantages. One, like everything else, this explodes your feature space. Um, but the second one is you have higher com computational complexity. So in order to get a second order or a third order or a fourth order uh, parser to work, you have to basically do lots of computational tricks uh, and, um, and stuff like that. So the good news is all of these computational tricks are exactly the same, uh, whether you're using a neural network or not. The structured inference algorithm is exactly the same. So let's say you wanted to do a higher order neural dependency parsing. You would just have to open their paper, uh, implement their algorithm, and, uh, and you could use it in your models. So um, this is not a, a major, major 
uh, disadvantage. Although you might have to do some things different, slightly different. Um, so are there any questions about this? This is uh, background up until we uh, talk about the actual neural models. OK. So um, like last time, uh, the first neural models in this area started out with basically using neural networks to be more efficient at calculating feature combinations. So um, this is like the, the Chen and Manning paper that I talked about for dependency parsing last time where it was basically a transition-based model that combined together uh, um, features more effectively. Um, the, uh, the main difference uh, is now that we're uh, calculating feature combinations for graph-based dependency parsing. Another thing is they used um, a cube dot plus 10h activation function, which is slightly different from the cube one. Uh, they also used averaged embeddings for phrases, which uh, proved useful. And they also used second order features uh, as well. So um, to go through each of these one by one, the phrase embeddings, um, basically the motivation is that uh, the words surrounding or in between head words and dependence are important clues about whether you should be drawing a dependency arc. So the way they did this was they simply took the average of the embeddings in each of these positions. So if you have um, if you have the head word and the, uh, and the child, here it's M for modifier, um, they average the embeddings for the few words in the prefix, the few words in the suffix, and also in this, uh, in this infix here between the head and the, and the modifier. Um, so then they, um, this, uh, this was useful. Um, then they also used uh, neural feature combinations. And basically, um, sorry, I seem to be missing a slide on the cube dot plus tan h activation function. But basically, the cube plus tan h activation function was, um, if you remember from last time, they did a cube uh, activation function. Um, so it's basically like tan h around this cube. Um, <laughs> So the idea here is basically cubes get really large and they grow, uh, like if you, uh, if you have a really large value of x, they grow and your gradients explode and your model training dies. So um, they just put a tan h around it and this seemed to work better and they evaluated that. Um, it's perhaps so simple that I, I didn't put a slide about this. Um, and so then they, they did this. They put in all the features from the previous models, and they combined them. And the, the answer is basically, yes, these, uh, these feature combinations helped over a strong parser. And basically, at, at the time, uh, they uh, gave state-of-the-art results. But uh, similarly to the model that I talked about last time, they still had to do all the feature extraction over part of speech tags, et cetera. Um, so uh, yeah, and then they also showed the second order neural parser was better than the third order uh, non neural one. So then the next, uh, the next obvious step is to put an LSTM on it. So <laughs> if, <laughs> if you put an LSTM on anything, uh, it gets better and you don't have to do uh, feature extraction anymore. So um, this, next, uh, this next model, basically what it did was it just had to buy LSTM a feature extractor, and then they calculated the uh, the edge scores by taking the uh, the extracted um, by LSTM features uh, and comparing, uh, in, you know, comparing uh, by using an NLP uh, to calculate this. And this was um, to calculate the scores. And this was basically simple and uh, and better accuracy than manually extracting features. Oops. So now, um, this is, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's by direction. Um, okay, so now I will get to the thing that's actually kind of the state of the art in dependency parsing right now, as, uh, as far as I know. It's, it's the model that's been really proven across a lot of languages. And I think it's the model that got the highest, uh, the highest score on average at the Connell uh, dependency parsing task. 
Um, and the idea is a, is a biaffine uh, classifier uh, to calculate your edge weights. So this is a first order model um, and uh, it calculates these values. So I have the equations here um, and actually the, the paper is not the easiest paper to parse, like um, <laughs> despite, <laughs> despite being a parsing paper. So I, I will try to, I, I went through the, the work of parsing it myself. So hopefully I can explain it here. Um, but the model is very well motivated. Um, so the idea is we have um, the uh, Ri. So Ri is the, um, basically the hidden representation for uh, word I. This could be calculated with a bio STM or, or whatever else. Um, and then we have Rj. Uh, so Ri is the representation of the thing we think would be a, a dependent. Rj is the thing that we think would be a head. Um, and then we calculate the hidden state of I and J um, as dependents or heads. So we have a different multi-layer perceptron to calculate uh, whether it's likely to be a dependent or head. Um, and then we have the score uh, for the arcs. And the way we calculate the score for the arcs is we first concatenate all of the, uh, all of the head vectors into a, um, into a big matrix, we um, multiply the, for any particular dependent, we multiply its representation with a matrix, and then we also multiply it uh, with the matrix over here, um, uh, the, the head matrix over here. And then we also have just a parameter vector u, and we also multiply this by the matrix. So the idea is here, the first term, um, here the first term is basically how likely are these two things to be a pair, and then the second term is how likely is this, um, how likely is each head to be a, a, a head of something at all. So the, the second one's like a bias term basically, and the first one is like the, the term for actually the scores between the arcs. Um, and the important thing here is that um, each word has to have exactly one head. So this is now a, a multi-class classification problem where you just want to uh, predict which word is the head of, uh, of each particular word. Um, and the way they optimize it, um, from what I could understand in the paper and from also what I've talked to, talked to people about, uh, basically just optimize the likelihood of picking the correct parent. You don't do any sort of structured learning or anything like this. Um, so this is a, a local first order model with global decoding um, using the MST at the end. Um, and this has the best results with uh, careful parameter tuning on the universal dependency parsing tasks. So the funny thing is that this part is really, really important apparently with, with careful parameter tuning. And half of the talk, uh, I, I went to see the talk at the universal dependency parsing task, uh, um, uh, like, workshop and uh, half of the talk was spent on talking about how they tune the parameters to do well. So um, w the good thing now is that the paper gives you a recipe about the parameters that you know work kind of well for this task. So if you're interested in, um, in some sort of parsing, you can either look at their parameters or just go and download their code and see what they're doing. So, um, yeah. What exactly is the concatenation matrix? Is it just concatenation of the head? Yeah, it's the concatenation of the head uh, representations after running them through that multi. So what are the total parameters? These are just the energy parameters you have to use. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are the parameters? So you have um, the parameters that go from a word. So you have your word embeddings. You have a bio STM uh, that converts your word embeddings to the R's here. Uh, then you have MLTs for the R's, for the dependents. You have MLT for the head. And then you have these U parameters. So that, that's all the parameters of the model. It's not, a, it's not that complicated. Um, so. Yeah? At what point can I be sure that for a particular architecture, I've done everything I can and this parameter tuning fit? Because it seems very heavily dependent on this. Because there might be some other architecture which would have done better had this been tuned better or something like that. So how can I definitively say that 
one is better than the other? Is it just do a grid search or? No? Um, unfortunately, you can't. Uh, <laughs> so, like, um, for very limited classes of architectures, you might be able to say that. But unfortunately, for everything in neural network land where you're not doing convex optimization or um, or stuff like that. It's really, really hard to prove anything definitively. Um, uh, there might be people who are better qualified to answer that than I am, uh, like people who are working on theory, like learning theory with, uh, with neural nets. But in general, um, telling which model generalizes is very hard to do when you have lots of parameters in your model, like so many that it's easy to memorize your data. Um, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> any other uh, any other questions? Yeah. Any part of NLP where I have doctor stuff still works better, or um, where where what still works? Any, any section of NLP uh -huh. where the old methods still outperform new methods? Um. So I, I think there are certainly places where this is the case. Um, if you mean hand, handcrafted features, I think a lot of neural methods now use things that look, are very much inspired by the handcrafted features that people are using elsewhere. So um, it's kind of hard to say. If you're looking for places where not having a neural network in your model is the state of the art. I would say one thing that I am intimately familiar with is extremely low resource machine translation, for example, is one place where it doesn't, uh, where neural methods still don't work as well. Um, there was a time that might still be now um, when rule based methods for co reference resolution were the best ones. Um, uh, there's probably there's probably other examples. So one one thing you should definitely know if you're looking at neural methods is that neural methods, if you have very little training data, like your training data sizes are very very small, um, and they have too many parameters, it can be very difficult to make them to, uh, get them to work, and much easier to make something like a bag of n-grams SVM classifier uh, to work better on you know like low resource document classification or something like that. So. Um, it's a it's a good question though. I, I'd be interested if people have other examples. Uh, does anyone know another example like this? No. Okay. Well, that's a uh, that's your unofficial homework. Uh, <laughs> if anybody can come up with uh, with other ones and post them on Piazza, that would be uh, appreciated. Um. Okay. Oh. Um. Yeah, one, one other example. Um, for many things like morphological analysis, um, like uh, analyzing, the, uh, analyzing word forms, uh, there's not very much data, but there are very extensive annotated dictionaries. Um, and they're like things that you can just write down by hand work, uh, work pretty well as well. So um, it really, if you look, uh, there are definitely places where uh, where non neural As for the rules, yeah. Um, yeah. Simply make unique rules and they're uh, very high precision rules, even though the coverage might not be very high. Right. Yeah. So, but neural networks will still take a lot of samples to learn that specific rule. Uh -huh. So, is there a way to make these neural networks very sample efficient? Because a rule is pretty obvious, right? Mm -hmm. If X, then Y. So, is there a way to just directly plug that into a model somehow without it having to see mm -hmm. hundreds of examples for that thing? So, so th these are all really good <laughs> general questions, not directly related to parsing, but I'll, I'll be happy to answer them now. So um, the, I, I guess there's a lot of different ways to make neural networks more sample efficient. Um, the, the most straightforward way, which is the way that most people do, is just to make the, mo the model um, make the model more fit, well fit to the task. And if you make the model more well fit to the task, so basically, you're going to have to pass things through fewer layers uh, to get what you want, or um, or something similar. Uh, you're usually going to do better than just a big LSTM or something like that. Um, another thing is combining them together with uh, discrete models. So one example of things that neural networks are really bad at doing 
is learning from single examples. So you have this huge training set. Um, you have this huge training set, and you run SGD over it uh, maybe five times, and they tend to end up forgetting uh, the things that they've only seen once in the training set. So they only see it once or uh, five times over the five epochs that you do. So things that explicitly memorize all the things in your training set, like engram language models, for example, tend to be better at extremely low frequency things. So um, methods that combine these two together, like incorporate engram language models into neural models, incorporate neural models into engram models, uh, uh, or other things like that, bias things based on counts. These are things that often um, can really help and make things more sample efficient or better at like memorizing things. Um, yeah, there's a whole there's a whole like cottage industry of these kind of hybrid models. I I have a few classes at the end of the uh, at the end of the course, and it might be a good idea to talk about those uh, there. Um, yeah, any other any other questions? Um, cool. So um, I'll move back to parsing. So previously. Um, uh, Margin-based uh, glo global training was used, um, and uh, what, so what about global probabilistic models in uh, neural nets for uh, graph-based dependency parsing? Um, there are algorithms for calculating partition functions um, automatically using dynamic programming. Um, like the Eisner algorithm is one example of things that can do this. Um, there's also, for non-projected parsing, there's something called the matrix tree theorem uh, that can compute marginals over directed graphs. Um, and these have been applied to neural models uh, by Maxma here at CMU um, as well. So uh, I guess a general theme here is a lot of the inference algorithms are completely independent of whether you're using a neural network or not. So if you know, um, if you know the previous pre-neural net literature and you can uh, take a look at the algorithms there, uh, they're uh, relatively easy to apply uh, and can be uh, useful as well. So next I will move to um, methods for phrase structure parsing. Um, so as you know, this is what we're, uh, what we're calculating. Um, so the important insight here is that um, phrase structure parsing is similar to, uh, to tagging. Um, while tagging is uh, search in a graph for the best path, uh, parsing is search in a hypergraph for the best tree. And the CKY algorithm is basically a very limited uh, version of this, but I think I, I really like hypergraphs. Uh, for whatever reason, I think they're very, very flexible and very uh, elegant ways to um, to describe the various things that we might want to do with graphs. So I'll explain them very briefly here. So um, basically, the the degree of an edge um, in a graph is how many. Um, is basically how many uh, arrows it has coming out of it, um, like this. So a degree one is something like in a tree. If we uh, if we take a look at our tree here, is a head node with uh, only one child node, whereas uh, something with degree two is a head node with two ch children. Uh, degree three is a head node with three children. And the degree of a hypergraph is the maximum degree of its edges. And a graph basically is a hypergraph of degree one. Um, did, did you, sorry, actually I should confirm. Did you talk about hypergraphs at all in uh, algorithms for NLP? No? OK. This is a really nice algorithm, so it would be a good thing to cover there as well. But, um, but basically, if you look at a graph, at a normal graph, we have uh, nodes with edges coming out of them and going into them, and all of these uh, and all of these nodes are or all of these edges basically come out of one node and go into one node. Um, so you can also view this as uh, basically a hypergraph of degree one. 
Um, so here, yeah, here's an example. So e each of these is basically going from one, uh, one node to one node. Um, so the, the interesting thing is, let's say we have a bunch of different candidates for trees. Um, so this is an example of uh, the kind of ambiguous tree. I saw a girl with a telescope. Um, and the red, the red one is, uh, you, get, you get the first tree, the blue one, you get the second tree, where the first tree is seeing uh, the girl by using a telescope, and the blue one is seeing a girl who is holding a telescope. So uh, the interesting thing here is you can see that most of the black edges in this tree are basically shared between the two uh, structures. Um, and um, because of this, because you can share the structures in this way, you can basically do dynamic programming that utilizes the sharing to, um, to calculate trees, uh, the score of trees more efficiently. Um, so the, um, like graphs, we can add weights to the hypergraph edges. And generally, these are the negative log probability of having a particular uh, production there. So um, if we have, um, or it could be just be the score of having the production there. So if we have a probability of uh, the verb phrase generating these three children in this particular context, and then you also have the, the probability of the verb phrase generating uh, BBD and P in this particular context. These would be the weights of the hypergraph edges. Um, so to connect this to the CKY algorithm, which I assume that uh, most people already know, CKY algorithm is basically hypergraph search. Um, so the, um, if you remember, the CKY algorithm um, this is actually uh, something called the CKY plus algorithm. It's a, an expansion of the CKY algorithm. But what you do is in a bottom-up fashion, you calculate the best score of all of these um, of all of these constituents, like VDD12, NP24, PP47, uh, VDD12, NP27. Uh, and then when you want to calculate the best score for VP one to seven, which would basically be disambiguating between these two uh, ambiguous choices, then you do something that looks a lot like the Viterbi algorithm. So if you remember from the Viterbi algorithm, what we did was we added the probability of the edge to the probability of the previous state, right? Or the score of the edge to the score of the previous state. And then we took the max or min, uh, depending on which, which direction we're going in. For hypergraphs, it's exactly the same, except instead of only adding the best score of the previous one uh, node, you add the best score of the previous three or the previous two. So um, just to give, uh, yeah, to, so this gives a very brief sketch. But basically, Viterbi, um, this is similar to the Viterbi algorithm, but CKY is Viterbi over hypergraphs. And specifically, it's over. A, uh, it's over a fully connected hypergraph where you have like one, three, you have your node uh, of one to three, then you have your node of one to two, and you have your node of two to three, um, and then you have your node of uh, one to one, uh, two to two, three to three. And then you, um, you have edges coming out of each of these like this. And then you have a, a separate edge going like this. And then, uh, so, so you can basically do, um, you can uh, create graphs like this and search over them. Um, so the important, I guess the important thing here is um, sorry, I covered, I covered this uh, very briefly, so I'm happy to take questions if it's not clear. But the important thing here is we know there's a dynamic program for, uh, we know there's a dynamic program for sequences. 
It's uh, the Viterbi algorithm. And the way we do the Viterbi algorithm is we calculate the probability of each edge, or the score for each edge, and then we do a dynamic program over it. The, in parsing, there's also a similar uh, dynamic programming algorithm that allows us to find the best score. And the way we calculate it is by calculating the probability of each hyper edge, the score of each hyper edge, and then doing a similar dy dynamic program over it. So everything that applied to CRFs, for example, also applies to trees if you, if you do the same thing. And similarly uh, to what I talked about for the Viterbi algorithm with its analogy of the forward-backward algorithm in CRFs, uh, we can do the same thing uh, where we can find the partition function by, um, by doing this dynamic program uh, over the hypergraph. So um, this is called the inside-outside algorithm. It's an analog to the forward-backward algorithm. Um, so you basically calculate, um, you calculate all the way up uh, to the very top of the tree, and then the score of the top of the tree, or the probability of the top of the tree is basically your partition, your partition function that you can use in, uh, in training. Um, so this is the same as CKY. Um, it's the exact same as CKY, but instead of doing this argument and taking the best, uh, the score of the best edge, you um, you take the log sum x, like I uh, like I talked about last time, uh, in, with respect to CRS or two times ago. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a summary here. Are there any questions about this? Yeah. So why would you why would you want to have edges encompassing more than two vertices? Um, and I guess the answer is because you can. Um, so the CKY algorithm um, the CKY algorithm only has two. Uh, or are, are you um, when you say more than two vertices? Do you mean why do we need this instead of this? Or are you saying why would we need to have something of degree three or higher? Because this one has degree two. I mean, from this diagram, we have to not able to understand that it edge connects uh, uh -huh. two vertices or mm -hmm. than two vertices. Okay. That's what the essential difference is in hypergraph. Right. So, so these edges all, um, if you look at each one of these, so, sorry if this is not super clear, but like this thing over here is one edge oh. and it has two children coming out. Is, is that more clear now? So this is another edge um, and it has two two. And this basically tells you which one you pick at this top node here tells you whether it's a, a tree that looks like um, whether it's a tree that looks like this or a tree that looks like um, like this. Is that is that okay? Um so the, um, so yeah, one very good thing about this, one, one reason why I like hypergraphs and why I, uh, why, or I guess one reason why I like hypergraphs is because once you realize that this is a tool that you can use, suddenly parsing becomes a lot less scary. Um, and the reason why is because it seems very simple to kind of write the forward-backward algorithm. You can have a, uh, um, you can have a forward pass, which is a for loop, a backward pass, which is also a for loop, and, and you're done. Uh, for this, you can actually just write a recursive algorithm that starts at the top and calculates the best score or whatever of the left and right children, and then combines them together uh, appropriately. So it's, um, it actually makes things like tree structures a lot less scary if you're, uh, if you're interested in handling this. Um, so, how has this been applied to um, how has this been applied to uh, parsing it with neural network models? So, the um, one example of this is neural CRF parsing. Um, so, neural CRF parsing basically uh, gives you a CRF-based objective that you can use to train uh, your parser. Um, so. This one doesn't use LSTMs or anything. It predicts the score of each span uh, using a feed-forward neural network. 
And then it does uh, discrete structured inference using uh, the CKY algorithm or the inside outside. So basically the way this works is they have this model um, where for each span that they want to calculate the score of, uh, like NP, DT, NNP over this particular span of words, they have a scoring function where they uh, calculate embeddings, uh, concatenate them into a hidden layer, uh, and then um, basically calculate a, a transform of this to, to give you a score for this span. And then they do this for all the spans in the sentence. And uh, once you've done this for all the spans in the sentence, then you can uh, just run the CKY algorithm or, or whatever else. Um, uh, they, uh, you can run the CKY algorithm for inference uh, or for searching for the best answer, or you can run the inside out, outside algorithm to calculate your uh, partition function. Once you can calculate a partition function, um, you can calculate the score of the best tree, and then that's your that's your loss function. The score of the best tree minus the partition function. Um, so this is. Uh, this is a very nice method. It doesn't use LSTMs or anything, but probably if you put an LSTM on it, it would do a little bit better. Um, <laughs> another, uh, uh, another interesting thing about this paper that I, I found really nice, but, um, but I haven't seen very many other places, is they did a comparison of feature-based models and neural models in the exact same setup. And they also looked at incorporating word embeddings into and sparse features into the feature-based models and the neural models. Um, and what they found was incorporating sparse features into the fe into the linear models uh, helped a lot. Incorporating sparse features into the neural models uh, didn't help very much. Uh, but incorporating word embeddings and uh, and uh, etc. into the neural models helped a lot. And uh, incorporating sparse features did not. So like which kind of features you want to incorporate is uh, um, based on the, the type of model that you're using, I guess. And I, th I think one reason why you can explain that is because if you take word embeddings and use them in a neural model, the neural model can combine them in the appropriate way. Uh, whereas, whereas each feature in word embeddings isn't particularly useful if you're using standard word embeddings, which is why the linear model didn't, uh, wasn't able to take advantage of it. Um, so then, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, that's a good question. I read that paper three years ago, so <laughs> I was just thinking as I was talking, can I remember what features were they, they were using? But I think it was, um, it was pretty similar to the ones I talked about before, like what is the left, what is the word on the right side of the constituent? What is the word on the left side of the constituent? What are their part of speech tags? What's the combination of the two, et cetera? Um, okay, so then there is a, um, oh, sorry. There's an even simpler paper that came out only one year ago. Um, and the idea is doing CRF based inference, uh, for example, requires a dynamic program, uh, which is, you know, it can be time consuming if you run it as part of your training loop, et cetera. Um, so, the idea here is basically they just make their classifier much stronger. They make their, uh, like the features input to their classifier a bidirectional LSTM, et cetera. Um, and then they just predict for each constituent, am I a span or not? Uh, if I'm a span, what is my label? And then they have a very, very simple thing that basically runs over, it's a dynamic program over the tree that just confirms whether it's a well-structured tree or not. So this is very similar to the first order graph based uh, dependency parsing algorithms uh, where you have this thing that for each span kind of predicts independently and then you just have a thing to make sure that you have a well formed tree. And uh, this worked um, remarkably well for them, I guess. Uh, and uh, you can go from top down so you can make your first prediction, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and also they did, uh, this allowed them to do various loss functions, like a local versus structured uh, loss function. You can also do CKY or top-down parsing, et cetera. And they showed uh, pretty good results here. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, so if you're using the CKY algorithm, basically it would it would do a search where you need to find. Um, yeah, so so basically, you would do a search, and you would be guaranteed to not find any span set overlap like this, which would result in a, a poorly formed tree. So every every child span basically has to be the division of a of a previous span. Or something. So the CKY algorithm enforces this. So if you just run the CKY algorithm, it will work. Um, so is this your CKY using features of, like the score or the span from any other language? So during training time, they're not even doing that at all. During training time, they're just like predicting the span. Uh, literally, is uh, more or less a binary classification problem. Um, during test time, they are running CKY to enforce that the tree is well formed. But it's it's just that it's not even like uh, it's finding the maximum score well formed tree and that's all all it's doing. Um, any other any other questions? At, at which yeah. level is the span predicted? Like at the terminal level or at the non terminal? So basically, all all substrings of words in the input. Uh, <coughs> receive a prediction, which might be like no span, or it might be the, the label of the span, I guess. So it, it's done It's done at the word level, and it's also done at the, the um, Anything else? OK. So up until now, I've talked about parsing. Um, I've talked about parsing algorithms themselves. Um, one thing to note is that um, some people, like me, like writing dynamic programming algorithms. Other people don't like writing dynamic programming algorithms. So um, let's say you want to come up with a really good model, and it doesn't decompose well uh, into a dynamic programming algorithm. Or you, you want to consider features that don't work well in a left to right model, for whatever reason. Um, so one good approach here, in case you have a really nice model but it's just hard to decode with, is simply to generate a bunch of uh, hypotheses with another model that's easier to decode with and re-rank them. Um, so um, yeah, so that's what you do. Um, so there are a lot of, or some examples of this anyway. So one um, good example is uh, with something called uh, inside-outside recursive neural networks. So the idea was that they had a neural network that parses the sentence from bottom to top and from top to bottom. Uh, or sorry, from, from inside to, uh, like the inside of a phrase and the outside of the phrase. And then they combined the information about both of these. Um, so this would be very expensive if you did it in, uh, within your search. So they just did parse re-ranking. Um, Another example is uh, a paper on parsing by language modeling. So basically, they just generated a huge uh, parsed corpus. Um, and then they trained a language model on it. And then they re-ranked uh, output from another parser. And this uh, seemed to work pretty well. Um, and another one is uh, recurrent neural network grammars. So I, I talked about these a little bit before. Um, and recurrent neural network grammars are, are hard to decode with because um, they're generative models. And you don't know. Um, like at the very beginning of search, it's hard to tell uh, um, what words you're going to be getting next. Um, so anyway, th this is a very nice uh, thing to use if you've come up with a good model, but you don't know an easy way to uh, incorporate it into your search algorithm. Um, but a word of caution about this. Um, so there was a, a nice paper at ACL last year. Um, so. You come up with a good re-ranking model, and it gives you state-of-the-art results, which is uh, which is a very good thing. Um, but an, one thing that we know from earlier classes is basically combining together two models is a really, really good way to get good scores. Um, so if you uh, through like combining together on ensemble multiple models is a really good way to get good scores. So if you're using a re-ranking model. Um, even if it's not for parsing, if it's for anything that you might do, like translation or, or semantic parsing or, or whatever, 
Um, the, you should be aware of this, which is that the model generating the parses basically prunes down the space of parses that your model has to consider. Um, then the re-ranking model chooses the best parse only in that space. So the idea here is that, let's say we have the, the space of, um, kind of the space of all the, all the parse trees ever, and um, our, um, our parsing model generates these ones. And then we also have uh, our re-ranking model. Um, and then maybe this is the one best according to the parsing model. Then we have our re-ranking model that has a, a set of um, you know, parses that it, it likes. And then we pick uh, one from this intersection and then our accuracy goes up. But in reality, the one best for the generative model is down here. It's just that the, or for the um, re-ranking model is down here. It's just that, you know, your, your other model really didn't like that, so you don't pick it. Um, so there was a nice paper about recurrent neural network grammars that showed they were probably good, uh, good models for, um, uh, for parsing. Um, but then this paper, what they did was basically they came up with a better method for searching for uh, outputs that match the, uh, the generative model, uh, generative re-ranking models, uh, top scores. So when they did that, they generated the candidates from the discriminative model and the generative model. And what you found was if you generated things from the discriminative model and re-ranked with the generative model, uh, the score goes up a little bit and you get very nice scores. Like 93 is extremely competitive on this pen pre-bank uh, pre benchmark. But if you generate um, directly from the generative model that we thought was really good, actually we get worse scores. And it's just because of this uh, re-ranking effect here. Um, and then of course if you combine both models together you get the best score because we know ensembling works in this uh, you know, if ensembling works, then we do, uh, we do a pretty good job. So um, long story short, uh, combining together multiple models works. So if you're doing re-ranking, make sure you're not just gaining uh, because of this uh, and you actually are, are comparing fairly. Um, so that is all that I have for today. Um, it was kind of about parsing originally, but uh, we, we talked about some other stuff as well. I'm happy to take questions on any of that. Okay, um, then I guess we can finish up. Thanks.